Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we've got a special Stay Curious show for you today. Welcome. We have got up on our screen in England, David Shaler. Hi, David. Good to see you. He's coming from Birmingham, England. And beside me is Mikey Haddad. Hello, Mikey. How are you doing, Mark? Good to see you again. Well, great to see you. Mikey Haddad and David are both uh, wrote a book called Space Lab Payloads that we're going to talk about today. You need to add this to your library. This focuses on on uh, these beautiful payloads in our shuttle era, 30-year era of building the International Space Station, doing all kinds of great science that today has revolutionized our world without a doubt. So we just wanted to say he hello to everybody out there watching on YouTube, uh, Spotify, Twitch, and of course, Facebook Live. And before we get going with these gentlemen about this book, we would be remiss if we didn't say 61 years ago today, manned spaceflight began for America when Alan Shepard's 15 minute suborbital flight uh, happened at about nine in the morning on May 5th, tw uh, 1961. 61 years later, we're waiting for four astronauts to come back. A little after midnight tonight, the Crew-3 Dragon crew are gonna come and land in, uh, not sure which side of the coast they're landing on, but they're gonna either be in the Gulf or the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, about 12.30 tonight. So that's exciting news. We got behind us here the Earth and the Moon to kind of set the mood for outer space payloads. And with that, I'm gonna say welcome David up there in uh, England. How you doing again? Good, good, and uh, well, uh, and Mikey uh, also is a senior payload engineer at NASA for how many years? 32 years. 32 years, and Mikey's going to be on our show uh, on a frequent basis to talk about payloads every month, which uh, is so important. These shuttle payloads are what's happening right now on the International Space Station, yes, sir. and they laid the bedrock for so many things, including our global warming database, a uh, very important, the Atlas uh payloads that I've, I've always love hearing mm -hmm. about. So uh, we're going to ask David to kick it off up there. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, David. Nardi? We're not hearing it through the headphones. We're hearing it through the TV. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just kick off the the visuals you have here. Well, first, let me ask you about you two collaborating on this book. Well, that's kind of what those first couple charts okay. we'll, we'll talk that's, about. This is, it was an interesting road to get this book written. Um, we actually started back in the year 2000 after the SRTM mission. Uh, we thought, hey, it's uh, basically the end of the Space Lab program. It's Everybody's t kind of still there. So let's try to kick off some way of documenting this. So the idea actually started in 2000, really didn't get off the ground. So then uh, you can see as we go down the timeline, we had a, a reunion in 2002 where it was talked about. Um, and actually in 2007, it came up under the Constellation program as possibly doing a hands-on kind of operation. Hey, okay, and then the, the idea of the book came again. Then uh, unfortunately, my lead engineer in level four, Dean Hunter, had passed away in, in 2010. So during his event, we thought, hey, this is again, and everybody kind of get together, let's, let's do a book. Never, nothing never really happened. 2011 comes up, we had a big, basically end of, end of the shuttle program party, where we got everybody together before the shuttle program ended and everybody kind of scattered. Again, nothing came up on the book. December 2011, um, we had, uh, uh, you know, those other things come up. Um, and then <laughs> as we go along, it was just a, a series of things over the years. and. Um, up to the, uh, well, the next one will be the second chart. Um, kind of what happened was, is, as we went on, 
through, I contacted a few people. Um, one was Jay Barbary, who actually used to live next door to what we called our beach house, which was kind of a place where we would meet and socialize. Astronauts and VIPs would come in Cocoa Beach, South Cocoa Beach. Um, he said, great book, Mike, great idea, but you're not going to make a million dollars. But he, he really couldn't help. Then I contacted Mike Malone about riding rockets. Um, he says, again, it's a, it, was a, it was a niche, but uh, it's, you know, it probably wouldn't do with his publisher. It couldn't really help. Then uh, we had a huge Space Lab One reunion in November 2013. Again, the, the idea of the book came up, nothing really took hold until four years later when I was talking with Mike Leinbach, a good friend of mine, and he introduced me to Jonathan Ward, who co they co-wrote uh, Bringing Columbia Home. Of course, Mike's launch director for yeah. over 37 shuttles. And he was very, yeah, a good friend. Um, we, we, see, we worked together on Space Station. Of course, yeah, he was launch director. Um, Jonathan says, well, he likes the idea, couldn't do it, but here's a person that I think you'd really like, and David was the man. Here's somebody who was interested in the Space Lab program, seasoned author, and basically that's when we got together, and it's like, well, um, looks like nobody else is going to write the book. So, so it says David and I took on the task, and that's well, how we basically met. Well, it's a, uh, it's a good – I've, I've started getting into it there. Now we'll get back there. Um, and it is a uh, very uh, – uh, Praxis uh, or Springer that does a lot of space books. Uh, uh, that's the book there. You can get it on Amazon and with your Smile account. Uh, of course, your nonprofit you want to put is the American Space Museum. And we'll be talking more, like I said, with Mikey every month about the shuttles of uh, payloads because uh, uh, we, we just we want you to understand more about uh, the pride that these workers had in what they did in um, this great era of America, the space shuttle era. Well, that's, we're going to, yeah, That's kind of basically how I met David. And so now, David, if you want to kick out, David's got a few charts here, kind of talk about how all the wonderful work he has done, of course, before we met. And we'll talk about all the work he helped me with uh, getting this book written. <laughs> and we're going to, he's got some pictures there coming across the pond with us, David Shaler. And uh, we're so grateful that you spent time there. It's a six-hour difference, I think, about 10 o'clock there, David. <laughs> Being very young, in a Christmas grotto uh, department store in Birmingham, uh, that the choice of uh, lunar transport vehicle options is not open, obviously, I'm a bachelor of nonsense, but there you go. Um, but that's 1959 from China. Uh, but I got interested in the space program in, like I said, in Apollo 8. That's what I really got interested in. I remember the Apollo 1 flight by, I remember Apollo 7. Uh, I said that I had a sophistication in school, got me interested in the Soviet program, and I remember vividly staying with my grandfather on the 20th of uh, uh, July 1969 and seeing the moon landing and stayed up all night, which I thought was cool because being 14 years old, I could stay up all night, um, <laughs> and I was allowed to, and also I've seen the first moon landing, and the moon was, and I've seen all of them since, so that was pretty cool. The second picture you might see there is one of the first books I had published, published by myself. Um, I set up Astro Info Service in 1982, self-publication, and these were sort of fanzine magazines. I did a variety of them on astronaut status, books, uh, shuttle annual reports, EDA reports, uh, a monthly on the shuttle, or the orbiter, a monthly on the Russian Sputnik. And I've done some previous articles for the British Interplanetary Society, magazine Spaceflight. I've helped all the other authors with photographs. As I said, since the 60s, I've been writing and talking to a lot of the astronauts, and they remember me quite well for these different types of questions I've asked them. Okay. Now, Here we have a picture of you with a shuttle magazine. Yeah, that's right. The third one is the first book I had for Challenger, 1987. That was a publicity photograph for a local newspaper. And I was sitting there in the bedroom, uh, with that cover of the book, it's become very popular. It's a very complicated type of book. Um, and then, um, over the years, I've written now over 30 titles, and you'll probably see the next slide is what I've written a few titles. Yeah, that's your book, stack of books there. The man is a seasoned yeah, author. Apollo's, a couple of Russian books, yeah. uh, Women in Space, Mars, um, and uh, and several books on the shuttle and spacewalking. Um, I also had the opportunity over the years 
Well, I wanted to just pause there a second, David. Just pause there a second. Let everybody digest there. Uh, from Russian cosmonauts to enhancing Hubble's vision, space rescue, yeah. Skylab. Uh, you have uh, you've got your name on all these books, and I'll bet a lot of our Stay Curious friends have some of these in their libraries. So. There's, that's right. That's right. And I'm always fascinated by the Russians. That Soyuz book I'll have to try to snag. Uh, oh. Yeah. Good. Well, that's cool. Well, the next picture is you with one of the next picture, David, is with you and one of our wonderful friends, um, uh, Mike McCulley. Yeah, he's a big supporter of our museum. Yeah, here we go. Yes. Well, just a second there, David, to uh, interrupt you there. we uh, I've got a copy of this book. And again, another great friend of our museum. Uh, uh, he uh, contributed uh, uh, a lot. We've got uh, his uh, fitting helmet in uh, in our in our case mm -hmm. in there. And uh, yeah, Jerry pa Jerry Carr passed away about a year and a half ago. And uh, but I wanted to double check. Uh, uh, just let's check there a second, David, on our audio levels and stuff, Marty. We've got. Uh, yeah, I think what's happening is picking up audio to the mic. For some reason, David's not online on speaker. Okay, well, he's not in our headphones either. Know, so, was, so that's what that's what the problem is. You I need. Know. So move the mic closer to here, and then both can both move around. Okay, is that? Well, you, there's a button, Marty, or something that needs to be pushed because okay, well, we were, we were all, I mean, I don't know what the, we're having a little technical problem going across the pond here, uh, but uh, so, so we. Around there and turn the volume up. All right, could, or David, we're going to go from uh, uh there to you, uh, holding up a bunch of books. Yeah, the uh, during the trip with uh, the Kenny Space Center, yeah. I had uh, the opportunity yeah, to actually yeah. see huh? a couple yeah. of my what books in for sale at the Kennedy Space Center, it's which I thought here. was really yeah. cool. Um, I thought it was really a smart thing to here. have it's seen coming. my books. He's coming through here now. You okay there? He's coming through there now. Yeah, we're having okay. a little trouble, David, getting your audio. Okay. There. Looking good. Now, is he talking in there? Okay, Marty. Yeah. Whatever you did. 
Okay. You all right now? Our our listeners hearing you good, David. Uh, good, all right, go ahead, David. We got you back okay, in our headphones. The, uh, the, I, mean, I found it very good you in the trip to the Kennedy Space Center to see a couple of my books on the shelf. It always gives you a bit of a buzz oh, yeah. to see the books on the shelf. You never actually want to read them because you usually find something that you missed or there was an error in there and you don't want to do that. <laughs> right. um, but uh, I always uh, think it's quite cool to see the books on the shelf. Um, and now I'm also an editor of the BIS magazine, uh, Space Chronicle, which is the next picture. Yep, we're showing and that. I actually convinced Mikey, I don't know how I did it, but I did convince him to write a feature on how they um, restored the Astro One payloads. And that appeared in the magazine. This magazine comes out four times a year. And it's a British space history magazine by the British Interplanetary Society. And if people are interested, they can contact me and I can give them the details of this magazine. Um, well, but, David, I'm uh, a I'm an amateur astronomer all my life, so of course it warms my heart that this, these optical instruments are being saved. And Dave and uh, Mikey talked a little bit about that a month ago when we had him on there. Yeah, so, in uh, fact, yeah, we're thinking about maybe one of the segments in the future is yeah. to focus on the restoration project. Yeah, we'll do that. that. Maybe well, one of the one of the fun books I enjoyed writing, you mentioned them a bit earlier, was the Hubble missions and the restoring the Hubble telescope. And that went over two books for Springer. So that, I have an interest in that as well. Uh, but I, I enjoy the hardware and how it operates and, and how the crews operate as well as the ground crews as well. Well, here uh, we, ha we have years, you with Buzz now. We're that's showing... right. Over the years, I've had the uh, opportunity to speak to several astronauts. We've done autograph shows in Birmingham uh, and in London, in Northampton and Coventry. And this is one with Buzz Aldrin. And we're having a chat here about a book that I wrote about the first Mars walks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the side stories of this, Buzz was giving a talk, and I asked everybody to talk, turn their mobile phones off, but one phone that went off was Buzz's. <laughs> and I did say to him the next time, I said, can we turn the phones off, please? And I turned to him, and I said, yours as well, please, Buzz. And he did <laughs> smile, so that was quite good. Um, but uh, 92 also, years old, on. by the way, he is right yeah, now. 90, yeah, one of four moon uh, markers it's left. Good, it, it was good. Uh, moving on, I had an uh, opportunity to speak to many of the moonwalkers, including There's John Cernan. Hunter, a photograph here with Gene Cernan, uh, again at Birmingham, and we had some good conversations. He informed me about the uh, the very rough edges on the back of Gemini 9 when he was doing the spacewalk. It was oh. like a razor on the back of Gemini 9. Huh. Um, so these interviews with these astronauts I find are precious, as long as searching the documents that are filed away, as I call digging in the dust, as Mikey knows, I like getting into the detail of things and asking the questions and getting beyond the headlines. Um, and also with the modern guys as well, the next slide is with uh, Jerry Ross. Seven-time flyer, Jerry Ross, no, no stranger to the Space Coast here. He's yeah, tipped Jerry's a few a beers or grills with the fans down there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he helped tremendously on the books that I wrote about assembling the space station and the EVAs up at the ISS. So I have an interest in space walking and EVAs. Uh, but I have fond memories of going around the Kennedy Space Center uh, in 1993 uh, and going behind the scenes and seeing some of the archives there and some of the documents. And also on the wall, there were schedules of how they was putting the spacecraft together, how the components of the SRBs and the ET was putting together. And from the offices there, I was able to get the status reports for the shuttle processing because I find it interesting to find out what happens to the shuttle on the ground between the missions. This is why I enjoyed working with Mikey so much um, to find out how they get the bits together. And nobody ever talks about it. And I think it's, a, it's an untold story. And so that's another area that I'm talking with Mikey about, about filling in the gaps between the missions. And I've got status reports going back here to 1979 up to 2012 of the monthly status reports. Wow. Um, and you see me there with um, Manny Verator of Public Affairs at Kennedy Space Center. There he was go. kind enough to tour me around. We went inside the VAB, went under discovery in the orbiting processing facility, and we had a great time walking around. And we've seen, of course, the night launch of STS-38, which was pretty cool. Wow, we've you're, seen the you're in front of the crawler there. The minutes, yeah. We've seen the main engines burn on that launch for about six minutes. It was amazing. Really? To really, really watch it go over the uh, night sky. Huh. Uh, and the final the final one we have here uh, is me, a little bit younger, a little bit thinner. <laughs> yeah. It is me uh, with more <laughs> hair um, and not so gray. 
in front of some of my shuttle books, uh, shuttle files. I have a collection, as Mikey says, you might see some of them behind me here on, wow. on the, uh, on the it's right It's an here. amazing each, library. Each mission is in the box file. I can just turn it for your viewers that you will see them all yeah, down there. There you go. Wow. What an extensive and library. And down there you have all the archives of the books and the missions accordingly. You got more so than I'm our museum has, archive. David. <laughs> You got more. I have I, been told some of, some of the astronauts have been here, and they've said they have more information here than they had for training. So, <laughs> and Jer Jerry Carr told me I'd, I'd learned more about himself uh, than he forgot. <laughs> <laughs> that so sounds like go. Jerry, uh, yeah, and I've heard him like... talk before. Yeah, he's he's very so interesting. So there you go. That just gives you background, and and I'll give you details you can put on my website. Every day I put on a Twitter on uh, space history every single day something this day in history uh today it was uh, the birth of don thomas as well who flew on um sts 70 sts 65 i believe his birthday's tomorrow msl missions okay don thomas born today or tomorrow i think he's um, may 6th yeah 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 well, we're May 5th here still in America. Yeah, you're almost there to May, May almost 6th. There. Almost there. Yeah, yeah, Don Thomas, uh, uh, an Ohio knot. I grew up in That's Ohio, right. so there's 24 right. astronauts born from the Buckeye State. But uh, well, uh, I'm sure our state curious people have enjoyed meeting you, David. And I, and since we've worked this out on the fly, we'll have you back on Stay Curious, right, gang? Uh, certainly we can find things to talk to you about. So thank you for for uh, spending a little bit of your uh, Thursday evening with us here tonight, all the way from Birmingham, England. And uh, uh, do you uh, uh, do you, do you look at the stars? Do you have a telescope? Do you do any of that? Uh, no, I, I, I've done a little bit. I don't do the astronomy. Uh, I have an interest. I follow the space probes. I, I focus on human space flight. I used to, as a young lad, try and do all of it. And mm -hmm. it just got impossible. Uh, but the amount of information I have here for human space flight, I don't need to do any more. So, <laughs> David, just in the pilots. Yeah. So, the, David, uh, when we, yeah, uh, when we get a little gray hair like I have too, and so forth, <laughs> you've got this tremendous. Where is your collection going to end up when well, you go? Uh, always, uh, that you is know. the thing. Probably in the British Interplanetary Society. I mean, I have. Uh, we've just scanned and put in acid free. Uh, covers 8,000 NASA photographs. Wow. Holy That's what I've got. 8,000 uh, NASA got... photographs. Wow. Yes. Well, you know, we keep our museum open with a quarterly auction, and these moon, uh, red lettered moon photos from NASA, particularly Apollo 11, are worth $400 each for an 8 by 10 yeah. We've sold them regularly. I don't know yeah. if you've checked out our auctions, but. If you haven't, go check. Uh, I think we're up to our 19th or 20th auction in six years. Uh, but I am particularly, uh, I'm involved with some of our collection, including uh, stuff on eBay. And uh, Mikey, there's a lot of Europeans that love the shuttle. Mm -hmm. We sell a lot of stuff to, to Europeans, uh, 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 shuttle related on there. So uh, is there a, a reason for that, David, particularly the Germans and Swiss and uh, England uh, are, are always buying up shuttle stuff. Well, there's a, there's an interesting space flight going back in Europe, dozens of years, probably a hundred years. Uh, the Germans, of course, with the uh, the rockets, and also um, the French and the, um, the the Europeans have the uh, space program, uh, but also Space Lab, of course, which is the connection with uh, Mikey, was European built. Um, so we have that connection with the shuttle because of the european built and some of the payloads some of the flights uh space lab d1 space lab d2 there should have been a space lab f which had been for france but that was cancelled because the mm. french decided to go with the um the russians and there were well, there was talk of actually flying a russian uh space lab payload in the 70s mm. and that was going to be that wasn't come out because that was all uh, again political as we know um, but those these things still happen. These things occur, and the shuttle was going to dock with Salyut uh, after Apollo Soyuz. But all the difficulties of the era of the 70s meant that didn't happen, and it took 20 years to get to Shuttle Mir. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a strong connection with 
the American uh, spice program and the Russian spice program, but it's a developing program internationally now with the Indians and the Japanese as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why I try and reflect in the Spice Chronicle magazine, an international uh, spice program, which is uh, developing around the world, which is good to see. Well, we're having a fascinating, stay curious conversation with David uh, 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 Shiler. Shiler, is that how you say your name? Shiler. Shiler, okay. Yeah. And he is in England, and he co-wrote this book with Mikey Haddad, who's sitting beside me, and a very familiar person in Kennedy Space Center. John Smith says hi, by the way. Oh, yeah, One of our okay. docent that was here today. Yep. He was here. He's usually a docent on Wednesday. Hey, John. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're uh, we're we're excited to connect with you. Okay, I, we I didn't realize what a, uh, a treasure uh, we were going to have on here today, and I know our Stay Curious watchers are really enjoying this. And we want you to jump in anytime there, David. Uh, but uh, want to say hi to Robert Law, who's watching on his big screen TV, enjoying a cocktail in Dundee, Scotland. We probably have Ophelia watching from Normandy, France. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Celentano's watching. Christopher Mick is uh, in Hudson, Wisconsin. He's an educator, and he's probably drooling at your collection back there behind you there. Uh, 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 he's Maynette, been collected over 50 years. <laughs> Maynette Smith. Uh, Larry Pushker is watching. Uh, he's yeah. a Michigander with Dave Stange. And, uh, and, and Rushe Sullivan is watching also. We have regular viewers on this and we love that you're watching us on YouTube uh, because we have monetized YouTube and that's so important to our nonprofit. I think we've made about almost $2 since we've been monetized on YouTube in, in a week, but that is a big deal and our IT coordinator, Bruce Jacobs, owes all the credit for making our, our YouTube channel just a beautiful looking channel. And there's just not stay curious on there. We've got so a very popular uh, 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 launch disasters, of course, blowing up stuff. <laughs> and there's a submarine on there that that uh, we're, we have a lot of views. I forget what that's about. But uh, anyway, we're going to have Mikey take over here a minute with some of his pictures. David, again, chime in anytime yeah. you want. But we're going to show you your book here. Okay, yeah, okay. and you can see why uh, when I met David and his knowledge of, of Oh. oh, the space and, of course, in Space Lab. It was a great fit. And one of the things I want to mention, too, you mentioned Maynette's watching. Maynette kind of, okay, we have myself, who hasn't ever written a book, uh, David, who's a seasoned author. Well, how do you get the information? Maynette Smith, who was a level four electrical engineer with us, she has maintained like an email distribution list. She's helped with websites. She's basically been our social media person on getting the contacts to be able to write this book. Hmm. The people that have scattered beyond NASA, the ones that are still at NASA. Um, and so she's been an integral part of the link between us and the people that we, we basically interviewed to, to write this book. Sweet. So, um, You're going to give us a little overview here, yeah. and picture so Just real quick, yeah, just a real quick summary. Again, Space Lab, again, was built by the Europeans and sent to the United States. Again, it was a joint NASA-European uh, effort, and this is kind of a configuration the the uh, cylinder on the back is what we call a module. The U-shaped devices are called pallets. And here you can kind of get a figure, uh, a look at what the, kind of the different configurations for the shuttle missions. Um, this is kind of a cutaway of what a module and a, and a pallet looks like with basically a hardware installed. You can see how complex this all is. And so when we went to write this book, we says, well, this is way too big. We're focusing on just the experiment part of Space Lab, the level four experiment integration which is the experiments that go inside a lot of that hardware. And on the right there where you see the pallet, kind of that, all the devices that are on top of that U-shaped device, that's kind of what we did. So again, there's so much to focus on. We had to, we had to kind of you know, tr trim it down and focus only on the level four part of the experiments. That's why I wanted to show this kind of how complex it is and why we had to focus on the level, level four experiment integration uh, part of Space Lab. And that's what the book is about. Uh, and again, an MPES. Uh, that was used, designed by Marshall for small kind of payloads. What's that an acronym for? MPES. That's the Mission Peculiar Equipment Support Structure. Mission Peculiar Equipment Support I'm Structure. I'm pretty sure I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a. That's good why we one. call it an MPES. Yeah, we <laughs> use acronyms a lot because 
<laughs> okay, now this is actually I, the building I, uh, room. Mikey, yeah. I usually call I usually call this NASAology. It's a language all of its own. <laughs> when I started at NASA, one of the first books they handed me was an acron acronym book. Yeah, it was a whole book. I've seen acronym. that book. Yep. Green, I think it was made. The, yeah, green paper. Book. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this is a picture of the operation checkout building. Basically, the room where a lot of the work we did in was on the left side. We see those large gray doors. The so part of, basically the south part of the building is where you'll see that was where we did a lot of our work. I want to show you that. So this is what the inside looks like. Now, this is taken and looking the other way, looking east in the building. And basically what happens, you look at the foreground, um, you have what's called level four. That was kind of our where we worked. And the different levels kind of describe the different form, the different levels of integration. It kind of everything started at level four. Think of it as like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. So you start on the basically the foreground, and as you work towards the center and then the background part of the photograph, it becomes more and more integrated payload. We start with the experiments. And then we, um, we basically integrate the experiments, which if you look at number four on there, basically that's called an experiment train. We do each individual racks, which I'll show here in a sec. And then those racks get integrated with a module, then a module actually. So all that is based, built up in this building to where at the very end on where, it's, where you see the number 10, that's where we actually test it against an orbiter simulator. The payload's configured, and we want to make sure it works against the orbiter before we actually go out to the orbiter. So a lot of the, most of the book talks about um, this area of, of integration, this area, the work we did. But because we went beyond this, level four, we did this, and we did pads, we did uh, on orbit, and we, of course we did uh, post-landing, uh, it, it changed experiment integration. So that's why you went from level four to experiment integration, because it was more than just that one section of the ONC. Okay, this is a picture of basically uh, the empty racks. This is what we get to start with. This came over from Europe like this, and that's what we'd start with. Mm -hmm. And so we'd populate each of the racks depending on the mission. This stuff, these racks were used over and over again. And so our job was to populate them for a mission, fly that mission, yep. reintegrate the racks, and then reintegrate for the next mission. This is one of the double racks in the Space Lab 1. The single rack is basically half one. That's a double rack, twice as wide. So you see kind of the, the, the center. Yeah, single in the middle. Single, and single in the middle double. and then a double on the side. So two kind of racks. And so this is basically one of the Space Lab 1 racks that we'd integrated for the Space Lab 1 mission back in the early 80s. So this so, is just one rack out of 12 that would go in that module. So one of the first things you give an experiment is the dimensions of these racks that yes. they're going to put their, their thing in there. What are the dimensions, Mikey? Oh, gosh, you remember? I don't remember now. In but centimeters you, or, or American yeah. material? <laughs> well, one thing you notice, too, is the blue structure. Did, did, did they work uh, centimeters? I mean, did you use the European measurements? We, we used system? English, and, and we had we used English, but there was the, the European, there was a yep, okay. metric as well. So, yeah, it was very interesting. But one thing to notice is the blue structure, these racks can't, can't hold their own weight. And so those blue structures are basically designed to support the weight of the basic rack. And then, of course, once we populated, populated it, not the experiment, just the experiment, oh. but the cabling, the fluid lines, all the stuff to support those experiments. So, Mikey, like the lunar module that Marty worked on, you could not go down the, the ladder on Earth because it was designed for one sixth gravity. Right. You're, you're shaving weight yes. uh, in the payload by, by it, uh, uh, the, the rack itself would not support the weight of these all this equipment. I wouldn't, I never, That's why never you see thought in, that true. Yeah, in this picture, you see the big blue frame. That's uh -huh. how we're lifting it. Okay. Because it's, it's physically. Okay, this is just a, a picture of the people that worked level four. Again, the nice thing about, interesting thing about level four was um, the way it works in most, most of the places in NASA is you have a number of contractors and contract engineering and, and technicians, and you have NASA oversight. Here, we did the engineering. Um, we did the operations. We did the scheduling. So basically, all of the people here are NASA except for the technicians. <clears throat> That was what's so unique about Level 4 is NASA did the work. We did, wasn't a contractor with NASA oversight. So if you look at this photograph, this is the people who work Level 4. The contractor is our technicians, which are kind of in the green there, mm -hmm. center part of the photograph. <clears throat> so these are all the people. But again, you can see just in Level 4 how much Level 4 is involved. So again, for the book, it was way too much to handle all of that. So we focused mostly on the engineering component of, of this this group of people well everybody's wet behind the ears there in december 1982 we yes, only sir. got two two you had uh, the april sts1 and november sts2 so everybody's really flush with yes uh, sir with uh, the new program right yeah there. if you look at the very center of the picture you see somebody in the middle there with a blue shirt on a lot of hair that's me okay that's what, yeah that's what uh, i kind of do see that <laughs> And I'll bet we got uh, some other friends of our uh, museum in there as well. Okay, now this is a picture of the technicians. We had some of the best test technicians on the planet. These technicians, they taught me a lot. You think come out of the college, you know everything, forget it. No way. These guys and girls 
knew their stuff. They mm -hmm. knew what it took to get the job done. Again, just a great group of people. This is the Boeing size contract that, that uh, helped us. Well, work. trying to figure out the fashions there. What year would that be? Is that still it's in the 90s? Mid, mid to late 80s, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, here's a picture when we're doing uh, testing on Space Lab 1. No, wait, I recognize two astronauts yep. in yep. the back is yep. Owen Garriott on the right. Yep. And I'm oh. going to say Ulf. You got it. That's the ones. Yep. Oh, really? Ulf Merbold. Merbold. Okay. All right. Okay. And kind of what this shows is, see, we integrate the experiments and we test and, and check them out. Well, this is the hardware the crew is going to see on orbit. So the crew comes and participates in that. Hey, this is the hardware they're going to be punching the buttons and turning the knobs on. So when we do the testing, they would be there for that. So that is another really unique thing about us. Us as NASA engineers working directly with the astronauts on the flight hardware they're going to see in space. It was the best job on the planet. I can't, I can't. But it's that. so interesting. Those racks there are being supported by a support structure. Above uh, support uh, structure. As they're, as they're working on it. That's... Yep. That's inside the racks. Okay, this is a picture of Space Lab 2 integrated in our north rails, uh, part of the operations checkup building level 4 area again. Again, this is the first one, Space Lab 1. This is Space Lab 2. Again, you can see how complex all the scaffolding. Months, um, I think this took almost over two years mm. to work on before we flew on Space wow. Lab 2. Uh, the next one is actually, uh, this is a graphic of Space Lab 3, an operation we did on the pad called, uh, using what's called MVAC. It was a module vertical access kit for some of the science, especially um, animals and that. They had to go in very late in the count. So we had to basically go in when the shuttle was at the pad, which means now you have to go in the shuttle, down through the orbiter crew compartment, down into the space lab. Look at the stick figures there. it's vertical, yeah. So if you look in the very center there, the module, you see one person hanging from basically a bosun's chair and a cable. Yeah. And when we talk about Space Lab 3, we will really get in and we we'll actually try to show some video of them hanging from this cable literally hours before launch, installing equipment and basically animals to support the flight. I, it I, was an amazing <clears throat> operation. These guys that did the MVAC were just... And no fear either. Wow. You know, so I just want to show that as part of what we did. Well, and you're 195 feet in the white room above the, the top of the mobile launch platform mm -hmm. because Travis Thompson, our Triple T crew closeout, uh, of course, now was his closeout crew involved or any of the people with that? Uh, yeah, it, it, we can get it on world when we talk Space Lab 3. But yeah, you have the orbiter people. You have McDonnell Douglas, which supported the uh, some of the equipment that was mounted in there. Then we had this level four people, the technicians, that actually were on the, the hook, on the cable that went down to the module. So you had a lot of coordination between a lot of different organizations to pull this off. It was an amazing operation, and they, they worked it. We had we trained in the ONC building, but, of course, this is the real thing hmm. for Space Lab 3. And when we talk Space Lab 3 sometime in, uh, later, we'll, yeah, we'll focus we will. on this. Yeah, we will. Space Lab 3 orbiting Earth in space history, this time in space. Uh, uh, and that is uh, launched April 29th, 85, uh, 51B took that up. One of my favorite patches because it's got the constellation Pegasus okay. beautifully on that there. I've never seen a NASA chart with stick figures on it. Marty, is that new to your eyes? No, you've seen them like that before? Okay. This is actually out of a procedure. Okay, and this is the Astro 1 payload. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is January of 86. It was ready to go out the door. And so this is the, this is again one of the one of the ones we're working on. This is the one out we're, the door of the of the uh, ONC. ONC orbital and processing checkout. Right. Too. We were about to go into the shuttle orbiter. Um, okay. And this is January '86, and so this is a photograph, pretty much just before we went out the door. Again, You're the, circled over there. It looks like that's my head, yeah. That's me, that's me circled. Of course, everybody knows what happened in January of in 1986, uh, which is kind of that like, actually looks like uh, astronaut. Uh, uh, an astronaut to me, but I'm pointing. But uh, there so, could be, there could be astronauts in I, that. I'm photo. always curious. Uh, that looks like, uh, uh, oh, not Voss, but um, anyway, how did the photo call show up for this? How'd that happen? I'm always curious about these photos being taken. It basically, they went out. They have you have it was a morning meeting. You always have a morning meeting to talk about the work for the day. Mm -hmm. And so we would try and schedule and let people know that we worked on this because they'll be working multiple shifts. They could be people working third shift, second shift. Okay, you got to come in at four, say four p.m. We're going to take a photo of the, of the whole team, and so we would work it through the through the mission, through the basically the normal scheduling and, and communication we had for each of the flights to say, hey, we need to get everybody together at this time in this place for this photograph. Hmm. That's kind of what happened here. No, and, and everybody shows up. And yep. Says, yeah. gee, I wish I'd uh, wore my toupee in my case <laughs> so I left it at home and you can see a lot of people okay so again this is the morning of january 28th 86 we know uh, what happened there 
This is just a picture of one of the uh, communication boxes. So after Challenger, we basically uh -huh. came to a screeching halt. We were flat out there come beginning of 1986 because we had so many payloads lined up, um, level four work. We were really, we were really busy. And now that came to a screeching halt in 86, mm. January 86. Well, now what do we do? We're not sure when we're going to fly again. Um, and so kind of uh, what we did is we, I think I missed one. Anyways, uh, we had, how are we going to keep these people motivated? How are we going to keep these people going? Mm -hmm. We created uh, actually a friend of mine, Scott Vong, and started what was, what was known eventually as the Level 4 Halloween Party. Mm. We figured that, all these talented engineers now basically are almost coming to a screeching halt. And so let's use, put this talent to use and do fun and have a social kind of, you know, kind of a big, um, think of it as a motivator to keep us going over the years uh, until we start flying again. And so we basically created at the Payload Beach House the Halloween party, which, uh, again, was kind of famous throughout the world. We had people basically from all over the world come to that party. And so it started in basically fall of 86. And went up to through actually when after we started flying, it was it was just a, a way for us to take all our spent up energy and put it into something, and uh, it was interesting. I, I got one one quick story about the, the the beach house Halloween party, a lot of them, but we had a lot of effects. We had a lot of smoke, noise, lights going off. Well, anybody driving by in their car would think the house is on fire. <laughs> Okay. This is a famous beach house. This is the famous nowadays. beach house. It's between First and Second Street and Cocoa Beach, right on the ocean. So beforehand, we called. We got in touch with the fire department, Cocoa Beach. We says there's three people on this planet that will call if there's a problem at this house. If anybody else calls, they kind of they're concerned, but everything's okay. They're just probably driving by and see all this and think the place is on fire. And so those are the three people. Luckily, we never had to make the call of the fire department, but we, they did get a lot of calls because we had so many effects: smoke, <laughs> wow. lights going off, noise. Um, it was it was a real it was a lot of fun, but it kept us motivated until we start flying again. I'd love to see photos of that party. Um, and we will. It's, that's one of the things that with the, with cool. the follow on we're going to talk about that. Yeah, and then this next picture, basically, I think it's the last. It's mm -hmm. uh, the last one. Um, is um, well the one, but just before that, let me see if we got the one with you had that you had up early. Yeah, that one there. This is kind of shows you kind of how busy it really got in the UNC building. Again, you're kind of on the west end of the operations and checkout building on the bottom there bottom left is the astro payload mm -hmm. the one on the on the hook is the light payload lighter in space telescope lighter in space in space telescope experiment and then the one on the right is the space radar lab so here's three separate missions three sets of hardware wow all at the same time in the same area of the level four area so this is you could just this is an example of just how busy we were integrating, deintegrating these missions. It was a lot of work, a lot of fun, a lot of hours, but well worth it when you see this, this science in space working like you wanted to. So that was basically the last one of the book. Um, the book, basically, this is kind of what the book went into. And then uh, we end basically with the end of the shuttle or the space lab program in the year, near, you know, about 2000 is where the book kind of, so it spans from the early 80s to about 2000, basically the level four space lab time frame is what the book is. Um, but there was so much. I mean, we spent four years working on this book, and there was so much that could not get in the book. And that's what that last picture was, is what do we do now? I mean, there's so much more to be told um, because you could only put so much, you know, 20 years of history into a 500-page book. You only put so much. So this is basically the tip of the iceberg. Um, and what we like to do and what we're hoping, and Mark has been very, cur very uh, courteous, is to allow us to start talking about each of those space lab missions here on Stay Curious. Well, that's what we're all about here on Stay Curious is promoting the space yep. shuttle era because one, the astronauts, over 300 of them are alive in our communities doing great things every day. And two, these payloads pioneered what is do, being done on the International Space Station continuously occupied for mm -hmm. 21 years. And uh, do you have any uh, uh, hardware up there that you had your hands on? Uh, yeah, well, yes. I mean, it was interesting. Once Space Lab was terminated, a lot of us from Level 4 went into Space Station. Again, for that exact reason, because the experiments flying on Space Station were basically we, what we learned on Space Lab went right into Space Station. So, yeah, a lot of the hardware we worked on early on in the assembly flights uh, for Station, of course, is still up there. Mm -hmm. and it's nice to go out at night and watch it fly over your head and know you had a piece of making that happen. Well, we've enjoyed this conversation with Mikey Haddad and in Europe, Dave Shaler. David is in England 
and we're so glad that you joined us, an author of over a dozen books, and I'm going to be Googling your name and checking out some of these books, uh, uh, particularly, like I said, the, the Russian ones. Uh, uh, there's a, did you ever, have you ever run across the Eurocom uh, Alex Carl? Uh, no, no, chance. I don't okay. Well, Alex has been on our show. Uh, no. We Googled him from Cologne, Germany one day, and he was here for the launch of uh, Samantha Cristoforetti uh, mm -hmm. the other day. And uh, so I just throw that out there. He's a, a Eurocom and also an astronaut support uh, person there at the training center in Cologne, Germany that I learned all about. So uh, we want to stay in touch with you, David, and learn more about you and Please reach out to us. You see something that would help our our international viewers stay curious. By all means, we'll get you back on here, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, that'd be we good. will that'd have be you back on here. Too. Maybe not with you, but we'll. That's fine because this <laughs> man is, like I say, he's a seasoned uh, author. He's got so much history behind him and in his mind that uh, you could you could talk to David for years. Well, like good. That. That's yeah. that's, what, that's what we love. That's what we love, and we hope you can come here and and bridge the space between us, David. Sometime. Well, that'd be nice one day. And come yeah, to our nice humble little day. museum here, uh, but. Uh, no, ex excellent little program here. Thank you, everyone, for watching it and us working through some technical things here. Uh, of course, our Trekkie Techie, Jessica Galloway, was behind the scenes with Marty getting things lined up here. And no, uh, it looked like a train wreck happening that stayed on the tracks, and and we got her done here. But, uh, David, any parting shots? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience and to see Mikey again uh, and, and just echo what he was saying. We would like to carry on the story and go in a bit deeper, interviewing more people, getting things down on record, digging out this information and putting it on record and sharing it and educating people. Uh, and the Astro Restoration Project is a good start on that. Uh, but it's also the information between the missions. I want to talk to some more of the engineers, the flight controllers, the astronauts who, who handled the hardware and put their experiences down in the program as well. We well, need to catch the plane and come down here because most of them are living around here. <laughs> you know that. And uh, he would, wouldn't he be an excellent person, Marty, to bring to our Shuttle Fest who next year? Uh, mm -hmm. We had an, um, an amazing event three weeks ago where we featured the 50th anniversary of the birth of the space shuttle era when Congress approved mm -hmm. the $5.5 billion to fund it in April 72. We had mm -hmm. over 200 people show up. Uh, and those are on, by the way, our YouTube channel there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you missed those, David, you might check them out. We had, yeah, we'll check them out. We had three uh, uh, launch directors, Leinbach, Honey, uh, 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 Her Harrington and uh, Seek and we had uh, Mr. Jay Honeycutt on here hope his wife Peggy and Jay are watching our Stay Curious they're usually uh, they usually do and as is Kenneth Morris is watching Rich Jones and uh, James Michael Sigler uh, and uh, we appreciate you all staying curious with us today Mikey you have anything to say to your buddy no. He's getting ready for bed up yeah, there. Yeah, he's 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 definitely got a late night over there. But no, I just want to say how how much David and his brother, basically was the editor, um, made this book happen. There's a lot of things that the way the book, the information came together, was direct results of David and Michael's experience in writing books. So I just want to thank them <laughs> beyond. I don't know how, how I could thank them enough that uh, that their work. Um, it's all right. The bar bill. The bar bill is on you, Mikey. <laughs> yeah you got it david so and then thank you for everybody watching um and again we're yeah. trying to do more follow-ons in the future yeah we're so, going to have you yeah. back next, later this month we'd like to have you on the beginning of the month and then later in the month uh, uh as we do our shuttles of may there's 10 shuttles in the month of may not too many payloads though this was a heavy month for the uh uh may was a heavy i'm looking for my timeline there it was a heavy month for uh international space station six missions of ten were hard hat missions to the space station. And we had the last flight of Endeavor and uh, the first flight of uh, Mir docking in uh, the month of May. So we'll be talking about that, but we'll get you back here, Mikey, and share some of your good stuff there. Absolutely. Uh, David, thank you all for thank your you time. Much. Marty, we need anything to button up there? Or... Okay, yep. 
uh, uh, we are so busy, Larry Pushkar, we cannot get to those T-shirts yet. But we have about two dozen left, and we're going to we'll get them posted up there so you all can buy them. I appreciate you wanting to do that and support our nonprofit here any way you can. Yes, and you those large, so we'll come, come we'll save them large. Okay. Well, we will save him a large on there. We're going to uh, put that on Facebook maybe tomorrow to try to get rid of our inventory of shirts from our 50th anniversary event. So tomorrow is Friday, and that means Tales from the White Room with the one and only Travis Todd Thompson, Triple T. So we hope that you stick around for that. Thank you for our guests. Thank you, Marty, and our wonderful museum for wanting, and our board of directors. We've actually got one of them here. Dr. Al Kohler has been watching. And thank you, Dr. Kohler, for the board supporting Stay Curious and the crazy ideas that I come up with and present to our wonderful executive director, Karen Conklin, who sometimes just says, really? <laughs> Go back and rethink that, Mark. <laughs> but, but no, we, we have a great team here. We're on a, a, a headed in the right direction as we have been spending 21 years preserving the birth of America's space age for one important reason, Mikey, to inspire the next generation of space workers like you and David have been inspired to, to, to share your stories here today. So thank you all. I'm Mark Marquette, and we'll see you tomorrow with Triple T to bridge the space between us.